Steam to water heat exchanges. Now, many buildings, particularly modern buildings, work, work with both steam and, and hot water. For instance, in, uh, in cities like New York, you'll see very tall buildings where they'll use either Con Ed district steam or they'll have steam boilers that send steam up to tremendous heights. And about every 10 floors or so in the building, there'll be a completely independent hot water heating system. And that could be operating radiators, it could be operating uh, fan coils, and or you know it depends on the on the system. Take for instance the new uh, One World Trade Center, that takes steam off of Con Ed because of its height, and every ten floors or so there's a completely independent uh, steam steam to water heat exchanger that that feeds into radiators that are on those buildings. Reason being, if you take a building that that is that high and try to run it on hot water, the static weight of the hot water over that tremendous vertical distance is going to be so enormous that you'd have to have really specialized equipment in the basement to take the pressure of the of the weight of the water. It's like going deep sea diving. So steam, which has you know literally no weight when it's when it's moving through pipes, uh, goes up and it carries a tremendous amount of BTUs needed to go into the heat exchanger to transfer the heat from the steam to the water to heat the building. It's a classic way of doing it. It's been around for a long, long time. So some tips about this. Here we've got the steam line coming in. It's going into a steam regulator, which has some kind of a temperature device. And this could be self-contained. It could be electric. It could be electronic. It doesn't really matter. Over here, we've got the water side. And let's say we're heating radiators with this. So this is the return coming back from radiators. And it goes into a copper coil that's inside this cast iron shell or steel shell and it comes around and it supplies out to the radiators and this is the the shell the tubes are inside and we're going to send steam around the outside of the tube the steam's going to give up its latent heat energy to the flowing water the condensate forms and it goes through a steam trap this is a service valve and it goes into a condensate pump that just fills up with condensate and dumps through a check valve, through another service valve, back to somewhere, back to a, a boiler feed pump or maybe even into a boiler. This is vented to the atmosphere. So the steam is pushing the air ahead of itself. The air comes through the trap, through the receiver, and out the vent. Now what's absolutely critical here is this vacuum breaker, which is in the side of the shell. Now I say it's critical because when the regulator shuts, the steam beyond the regulator is going to condense and shrink 1,700 times in volume. So you're going to get a vacuum forming inside this. It's kind of like holding a straw in a, in a glass of water and putting your finger over the top of the straw and lifting it out of the glass. The water stays in the straw, right? Why? Water stays in the straw because it's, it's a battle between the static weight of the water, gravity, inside the straw against the atmospheric pressure that's against the bottom of the straw holding it up. So we need to get atmospheric pressure into the top of the straw by lifting your finger to make the water fall. That's what the vacuum breaker does. As soon as vacuum begins to form in there, the vacuum breaker opens to allow air into the shell, and then the weight of the water in this pipe pushes the steam condensate through the trap and into the condensate pump. Now this is why you'll often see the shell and tube heat exchangers mounted up high on a rack and the trap way down low. Because when the regulator closes, all we have to push the condensate through that trap is the static weight of the water. Remember, we have no more steam pressure at that point. There's just atmospheric pressure inside the shell allowed in by the vacuum breaker. So we want to get this trap as low as we possibly can below it. If the trap is too close to the outlet, for instance, last year I looked at a, at a problem that somebody had shown me where a coil kept freezing. And they had cold outside air moving across this coil. And they had installed the trap right at the bottom of the coil. So when the control valve on the coil shut, the water, the condensate, just stayed inside the coil. And the cold air kept moving across it, and it kept freezing the coil and freezing the coil until finally somebody realized that that trap was way too close vertically to the bottom of that coil. They lowered it, and it solved the problem. So this is when we've got a vacuum breaker and a steam exchanger, and everything is pretty simple here. Let's make it a little bit more complicated, because what's going to happen if we don't get the water out of that shell, it's going to get hit with water hammer because the water will lay inside the shell and the next time the steam enters, it's going to take that water and bounce it off the back of that shell. It's going to turn around, it's going to hit the tube bundle and put holes like that in your tube bundle. And that happens all the time. And that'll happen on the very first cycle. It's not like something down the road. This will happen the very first time you start it up in a steam to water heat exchanger. So the vacuum breaker is absolutely necessary in these applications. 
Let's make this a little bit more interesting. Here we're heating domestic hot water in this big tank, and we're going to have a, what's called a bayonet heater sticking inside of the tank. And, and we're reversing it here because now the water is inside the tank and the steam is inside the coil. So the bayonet heater is just this big trombone-like device that goes in there and it steams inside of it and it turns around to condensate, comes back by gravity and it's flowing down through a trap. And in this case, we've got a check valve. And over here on the steam supply line, we have another trap and another check valve because we decided to give this one an overhead return just to make it more interesting. So the steam's coming down because steam doesn't know up from down. It just knows out. It's looking for an air vent. And we're going to send the steam through a regulator, which is sensing the temperature of the water in the tank. And the condensate's going to come out. And as long as that regulator is set properly and it's high enough in pressure, we can lift the condensate through the check valve and up. You need one pound of pressure to lift water about two feet. So if this were a 10 foot lift into the overhead return, we'd need at least five pounds of pressure to get that job done. But what happens when the regulator closes? Suddenly we don't have any pressure here because the steam is off. So the check valve is closed and the weight of the water in this pipe is keeping the check valve closed. The weight in the water in this pipe is also keeping this check valve closed from the trap that's draining the steam that forms on startup in the steam main. So now the steam condensate is going to flow back into that trombone-like bayonet heater. And the next time this regulator opens, you're going to get water hammer inside that, and it's going to cause that same problem we looked at earlier. It's going to bust the tube. So to keep that from happening, the classic way is to use what's called a spill trap. And that's just a standard three-quarter inch floating thermostatic trap that's mounted about four inches higher than your operating trap, and this spills to a drain. So normally this is closed. When the, when the regulator is operating, the steam goes right by it because the trap is closed, and you get your lifting of the condensate, and life is good. But when the condensate starts to back up after the regulator shuts, it's just going to open that trap and spill out. And on every cycle, you lose a little bit of water, but it's better to lose a little bit of water than it is to lose a tube bundle on every cycle. So that's an old-time trick, and it works like a charm.